I'm Dr. Paul Cox. I'm excited to talk to you about ethnobotany and the role it has played in the discovery of the EPIC products. Um, ethnobotany is the study of how indigenous people use plants. These plants are a lot of different things. This is a, called a kota from the Sami people of Lapland. This is actually a piece of reindeer over here, Warren. And can you guess what they use this for? This is used to go milk reindeer. You crawl out on the snow, stand under the reindeer and milk it. And the Sami have a mythology that the birch, they make these from large swellings in the birch trees, can help preserve their milk and make it uh, good and last longer. Um, people, indigenous people, use plants for medicine. This is uh, from the mochi culture of Peru. This is a little ceremonial cup. This is 2,300 years old. Um, and it shows a little medicine man grinding plants to use for medicine. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. They use plants for shelter and for food. This is a winnowing basket made by the Goshute people. Uh, a wonderful uh, weaver in Ibapa, Evelyn Pete, made this. What they do is they take pine nuts, put in some charcoal, sort of roast them and winnow the chaff away, made this out of willow. I, I think it's just a lovely thing that they've done. And they also use plants for ritual. This is uh, from the Maori people of New Zealand. This is called a whakahuia. It's a, uh, it's a treasure box, really that held special feathers uh, from now an now extinct bird uh, that only the chiefs could wear to show their authority. And I love it because if you look at this sort of spiral, it looks like a, a yam tendril, um, but it also looks like a spiral galaxy. And it's like, well, the universe has this, this rhyme and reason to it, but when you, when you open up the box, it's what we make it. It's totally random and exciting. So. Um, it's been really fun for me as an ethnobotanist to spend time with indigenous people around the world. Um, I worked mainly in the South Pacific and South Asia islands, but I was trained in Middle America and South America. I've worked in those continents. I've done a lot of work with Native Americans in North America. Had some exciting times in Scandinavia with uh, uh, the Sami reindeer people way up in the Arctic Circle. Um, I've spent some time in Africa uh, working, so it's just been a great experience for me. One of the reasons I've loved it so much is that I love people and I love plants. And boy, if you like those two things, you'd make a good ethnobotanist. Let me give you a little bit about of my, a little bit of my background. My dad was a national park ranger and a state park superintendent. My mother was a scientist. Uh, I got to grow up in some wonderful places. Um, I love plants. Uh, my wife, Barbara, uh, sends me flowers. I think I'm one of the few men in the country that, whose wife regularly sends him flowers. We communicate through the language of flowers. She knows how much I love them. Um, these daffodils here were growing in our garden. She planted them and brought them in for me. Uh, I love flowers. I love plants. I've always really enjoyed seeing the little flowers grow. And when I was a little boy, I used to pray every night that God would bless the flowers and trees, bless the animals that have no voice, do everything they could to, uh, uh, to help protect our world. Um, this interest got accelerated when I served a mission for my church to Samoa. I was called for two years to, and lived in some very remote islands. The people were so lovely. I, loved in a, I lived in a thatched hut with crushed coral. Um, uh, slept uh, with mats. I had a Samoan companion that was still learning English by reading the King James Bible. Uh, wow, it was great. I used to go out at night and help the uh, fishermen bring in their canoes and look at their catch. The people were so kind to me and they taught me so much. And I came away not only with a great respect for the indigenous people, but I came away uh, with what they, gift they had given me, which is the gift of their language. Uh, Chief Almalosi used to come down every day to teach me how to say the language. Initially, it sounded just like syllables to me, but after I started to understand, he taught me the Proverbs, legends of Samoa. Later, I branched and learned Tongan. I studied Tahitian, Kapinga Maringi, some other island languages. 
So when I got back, I finished up my college degree at BYU in Botany and Philosophy. I won a Fulbright Fellowship in the University of Wales where I studied with one of the greatest rainforest biologists in the world, uh, Paul Richards, uh, and then won a Danforth Fellowship and National Science Found Foundation Fellowship to do my master's and PhD at Harvard University. That was a great experience, and Barb and I were able to go back for my doctoral dissertation work on rainforest biology and live with our little family in Samoa again. It was during that time that I encountered a very famous ethnobotanist, Richard Evans Schultes, who's considered really the father of ethnobotany in this country. When he heard that I was fluent in Polynesian languages, he invited me to his office and said, you've got to, you know, you've got to study these languages and you've got to study ethnobotany. So I started doing ethnobotanical studies on weekends and really had some fun time studying how people use plants for food, for uh, shelter, uh, for other things. I steered away from medicine because it seemed to be a really very sort of difficult uh, 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 study for me. But that changed when my mother uh, contracted breast cancer. Um, I was very concerned and thought about going back to medical school to become an oncologist so I could help her. But then I realized if I could study indigenous healing systems and discover a new drug, that instead of helping hundreds of people like I would as a physician, potentially I could help millions of people. I went to the U.S. National Cancer Institute. Um, Dr. Gordon Craig, the director of natural products, uh, had a meeting with me and some of his colleagues. And I told them that I thought I probably had about a 1% chance, just 1% chance of discovering a new drug. They said, well, actually, Paul, we've been talking about you. And we think you have a 3% chance. 3%? Wow! I realized that if there were 33 other people like me, one of us would, uh, would have a shot. So something else wonderful happened at the same time. My mother, of course, unfortunately died of breast cancer. But a few months after she died, I got a letter from the White House from the President of the United States. He'd named me as a presidential young investigator. I got a, a big source of research funding to do any research I wanted to in the world. I said to Barbara, let's go back to the islands. Let's go back to Samoa. Let's see if we can find a cure for breast cancer. So we went back to a very remote island. We took our children. We had four at the time. We lived in this little uh, hut, thatched hut, with uh, just slept on the mats. All we took was my research gear and the children's uh, school books. We'd worked with their teachers so we could go for a whole year and uh, see what had happened uh, and keep them up in their schooling. Uh, Samoa was fantastic. The rainforest when we drove in was like a cathedral. I could hear the birds cooing. I could see the giant lianas. The trees are so huge and you look at the light filtering down. I mean, it's just beautiful. It's extraordinary. And the indigenous people know about it. So there were some wonderful healers that I apprenticed with to teach me how they use plants for healing. Epinesa Mauingoa, Pela Lilo, others helped teach me their traditional healing systems. We got quite excited because uh, we didn't find anything for cancer, nothing in the plants that we uh, sent uh, with the healers and village and government's per, uh, permission for testing at the U.S. National Cancer Institute showed any e uh, efficacy. But they asked me at the National Cancer Institute if there was anything for viruses. They were interested in discovering new drugs for HIV AIDS. Uh, there was one plant I was really interested in that Epinesa Mauingoa had shown me. She scraped the bark, made a potion, would give that to a patient. Uh, the patients seemed to me to have what I would call um, uh, anti, a, a rapid viral onset illness. I wasn't sure if it was uh, hepatitis or yellow fever. We later discovered it was hepatitis. But I took samples of the bark and the healer's potion. Again, with the government's permission, the prime minister of Samoa got very interested and excited about what he was doing, the village's permission, the people's permission returned it back to the National Cancer Institute, and bingo, we discovered a very active new drug candidate for HIV AIDS called Pristratin. 
I was so grateful that the National Cancer Institute stood behind me in my assertion that there should be a return of this intellectual property back to the indigenous people. Things are going great and then bad news happened again. A logging company showed up and started cutting the rainforest down, the forest where we discovered this plant that showed activity against AIDS. The people were devastated. The villagers felt that the forest was sacred. It was sort of their gift from God. So I asked the chiefs, why did you allow the loggers to come in and cut this rainforest? And they explained that they had no other choice if they wanted their children educated. The government required them to build a school. They explained they were poor people, they're just subsistence uh, agriculturalists and reef foragers. And here the loggers showed up and offered to pay for the school if they'd allow them to destroy their 30,000 acre, 10,000 hectare rainforest. Um, this was terrible. I asked the village chiefs, what if, what if we could raise the money to build the school? Could you protect your forest? In response, they sent two chiefs with machetes up to block the loggers from coming back. And then I came back to Barbara with good news and bad news. The good news was we had saved this large lowland rainforest in Samoa, one of the last ones left. Bad news was to get the money, we'd have to sell our house, our car. We'd basically have to cash out with everything we had. How did she feel about that? Um, you know if your marriage is working at a moment like that, Barbara took my hand, looked in my eyes, and she said, Paul, how often will we have a chance in our lifetimes to do something like this? Let's go for it. Wow. Well, our friends and family found out what we were up to. They started sending money to us. Uh, two wonderful men, Rex Mon and Ken Murdoch, made significant gifts. I was able to return several weeks later to Samoa with $85,000 in my backpack, and we didn't even lose our house. When I walked in with the villagers, several hundred, into the logging company, we had purchased logging rights right out from under the company. We repaid the loggers, and then the chief said, don't ever come back, don't ever destroy our forest again. It was a great day. I wanted to find a way, though, that we could return money faster to the indigenous people. And I started noticing how even the elderly women had beautiful skin, long, silky, beautiful hair. I asked them, how is this? Some of the healers I was studying with were over 90 years old. They said, well, we're using plants. You, you haven't asked. So I started looking at some of the way indigenous people use plants. And this led to the epic line. I'd published a scientific paper. I was interviewed and invited by several of the world's largest cosmetic manufacturers to meet with them. They were very kind to me. They had amazing laboratories. I mean, one of them picked me up in a limousine that was bigger than the whole apartment we had at Harvard. Um, but then when I said, how can we return funds from these products to help the indigenous people? They say, oh, oh no, our lawyers won't allow us to do that. I was very discouraged and a friend said to me, well, have you heard of NewSkin? I said, well, I've heard of it. I don't know much about it. They arranged for me to meet two of the founders, um, Blake Roney and Steve Lund. And when I asked them if they could help send money back if we made successful products, they said, well, of course. That's why we're in business, to help people. And to prove this, they invited me to their convention. It was really scary. There were like 15,000 people in this basketball stadium in Salt Lake City. I was supposed to give my speech. They gave me a big check for $75,000 to build a walkway through the Falia Lupa rainforest so the people could get tourist money without ever cutting a tree. And that continues on today, so I was very grateful. In fact, Sandy Tillotson, one of the founders, and Steve Lund came all the way to Samoa to cut the ribbon on that walkway. It was such a, a great thing to meet these wonderful people who have a company, and their dream is to help people live better lives. What a great thing that was for me. Today, that school has multiplied. Let me just say this, I'm not a business person, but my real belief is that NewScan is a company that makes dreams happen. 
They give business opportunities to people. It's been so wonderful for me to meet the distributors and see the wonderful things they're doing. But my dream as a little boy was to save plant species, to save forests. Later, as I became really so enamored with the indigenous people, it was to help them build schools, hospital, medical clinics. Barbara and I thought it was really a lifetime achievement for us to build this one school in Folly Lupo. Because of Force for Good and New Skin Epic Products, we've been able now to build 300, 300 schools, hospitals, medical clinics in 65 countries around the world. These schools are built and the people promise to protect their forest or their coral reef. It's been just such a wonderful experience. Barbara and I were together in a remote island in Fiji, um, dedicating the 300th school, a Force for Good project. It was so exciting. The people had never had a proper school. Uh, a little girl who was barefoot came up to Barbara and said, can, can I please have my picture with you? Barbara, of course, allowed the picture to be taken. And then we discovered that this girl walks 14 kilometers every day barefoot to get to that school. That's how precious these schools and these projects are to the people. Um, you know, these aren't projects that make the front page of the big newspapers. They're not on the national network news. But boy, these Force for Good products that produce the funds for the Force for Good result in projects that mean so much to the indigenous people. I, I, I just really wish that I could take you in my Land Cruiser or we could get on the plane and go. I'd love to show you some of these projects and how much they mean to the people. So what we're going to talk about in future broadcasts here are about the epic products. I want to teach you about the ethnobotany behind each of these products. And what I particularly want to teach you is that epic combines generations of indigenous wisdom with cutting edge modern science to produce these wonderful products. And for me, the exciting thing is that every time an epic product sells, 25 cents goes to the force for good that not only funds these projects I've discussed, but many other good things for children throughout the world to improve their lives. I'm so grateful that you've accepted me to, as an ethnobotanist in your company. It's been so great for me to be with such terrific scientists. Uh, the founders are terrific. And the thing that's really surprised me, I guess I should have realized, is I've had such pleasant experiences with the distributors. I'm so grateful for the great work you do. So grateful for your support of the Epic Products and Force for Good. So, see you next time. Thanks so much. <laughs>